We're at the end of the program, but there's one last thing to do. Some of you have a one o'clock meeting, so um, you're gonna have to try to get to that one o'clock meeting. But what's gonna happen now? We got a treat for everybody. Back that back. So this next action, Josh started out by saying hello Bulgarians. Well, if some of you went on YouTube and looked at the protests that they had, they had a protest that included a march. And this march was a march carrying bread and placing it in front of their government building because they were talking about drilling for shale gas in the grain growing region of Bulgaria. Well, this next action is very important to me personally, not just organizationally and as a movement. This is important to me because I, before I started Mountain Keeper, my wife and I were farming. We fed 150 families with fresh vegetables every summer. We got hit with 200 year floods and a 500 year flood in a five year period. It took out three of our tractors, all of our irrigation equipment and 60% of our topsoil. We had to stop farming on that field. That was the end of our vegetable operation. We still have cattle and sheep, but we're not doing the vegetable operation. It is really difficult in today's world to be a farmer. We don't need this in our agricultural regions. And what we have here is some people that need an introduction and will introduce themselves. And then somebody that doesn't, Sandra Seingraber, that you all know if you've been paying any attention to this movement. And we have these New York grown grains, New York milled grains, and New York baked grains that have been donated for us to break as a community. And after we share this delicious New York commodity, we are gonna march with a band of farmers. If you're a farmer and you didn't, weren't here at the beginning, I got a whole bunch of farmers. I want all the farmers to come up here to the front of the line as we finish to lead the march to the governor's office. We are going to give him a gift of abundance of New York and New York's agriculture, something he needs to pay attention to instead of going for quick cash. Everybody. My name is Sandra Seingraver, and after three years of fighting fracking together, I feel like we've become old friends. You know my story, how I grew up in a heavily industrialized river valley in Illinois, just downwind and downstream from the state's biggest polluters, dirty coal, ethanol distilleries, aluminum smelters, how my hometown drinking water wells were contaminated, how I developed bladder cancer at the age of 20, and how years later as a biologist I learned that I was one, just one data point in a cluster of cancers in the zip code that I called home. You know that when I became a mother, the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me I moved my children to upstate New York to get away from all that, only to find myself in the crosshairs of the world's largest and most polluting industry with 40% of the land in my county already leased to the carcinogen dependent process of fracking. And as if that weren't enough irony for English professors, hear this. The Riverside Bluffs of Illinois are now going to be strip mined for frack sand so that the remains of the beloved landscape of my childhood can be carted off absent our intervention and shoved into the fractured landscape of my children's childhood. Beautiful grains of Illinois river sand forced into the fissures of New York shale, forced to prop open shattered bedrock so that all manner of explosive vapors and carcinogenic radium, arsenic, uranium, benzene can come flying out like bats out of Pandora's box, exposing the people that I grew up with in Illinois to carcinogenic silica dust and exposing my kids here to smog and radon. So today, friends, let's speak plainly. Fracking is wrong. Fracking is unmitigatable. Doing fracking right just means building time bombs with longer fuses. 
There are no places in New York and there are no children in New York that we are willing to sacrifice to the fracking gods. So withdraw the Eskice fig leaf and start the hell over. Over the past three years, we have spoken many clear and beautiful words together in testimonies, in speeches, in hearings on the banks of the Delaware River. And as far as I can see, there is just one word left to say, and I offer it to you as a torch to carry before you into your meetings today and to carry with you as you carry your bread to the governor. This word is the answer to the riddle. What do Harriet Tubman and the Bulgarian parliament have in common? And the answer is the word abolition. Harriet Tubman, the citizen of Auburn, New York, the most famous conductor of the Underground Railroad, did not advocate for state-of-the-art slavery. She did not advocate for promulgating 1,500 pages of regulations about slavery or allowing a few showcase plantations to demonstrate how slavery could be done right in the southern tier. Harriet Tubman settled for nothing less than a total ban on the grounds that slave labor, however useful to the economy, is a homicidal abomination. Last week, Bulgaria announced a total ban on fracking. It covers the whole nation, and it is permanent and unlimited. Permits to frack that Chevron held have been revoked. Bulgaria has abolished fracking. The Bulgarians are fracking abolitionists. How did they get there? The Bulgarians marched in the streets of 12 cities. The Bulgarians blew whistle, they banged drums, they played fight songs on bagpipes. The Bulgarians employed giant winged stilt walkers. They had edgy street theater and very cool public service announcements. And when their parliament said, okay, fine, here's a temporary moratorium, the Bulgarian people said, not good enough. We'll settle for nothing short of abolition. And they marched in the streets again and the parliament voted 166 to 6 for a permanent nationwide ban. So New York, are we meeker than the Bulgarians? Are we more frightened than the Bulgarians? Are we more resigned to a toxic future than the Bulgarians? All right then, you've seen me carry around this loaf of bread and I have said this bread is baked by a baker in my own village of Trumansburg, New York, and the molecules of this water and this flour become the molecules of my children and I will defend it. And now we've brought hundreds of loaves of bread and I brought before you the baker of this bread to tell you how we're gonna do this procession to the governor. We're gonna break bread, not shale. I give you Stefan Sender. So my name is Stefan Senders and I am a baker. And uh, beside me are Tor Oshner and, uh, and Neil Johnson. And he's a miller, Tor's an organic farmer, and we work together. So we're bringing bread here to intervene in the self-destruction of the great state of New York. We come as farmers and bakers and millers to remind our state, to remind our governor that despite the promises of industry lobbyists, the exploitation of shale gas is a bad and broken economy of the worst kind. So this bread is the product of our community and our farms, and the wheat is grown and tended and harvested by our local organic farmers. It's fresh from the soils of New York, and the flour is ground in our local flour mill, and it is as fine as concerned and caring hands can make it. So to resurrect a term long since emptied by advertisers, the wheat, the flour, and the bread are wholesome. They bring our communities together and they give us work. They nourish us, they please our senses, and they make our bodies and our land more healthy. This is a good economy. It's a wise economy, it's a steady economy that nourishes the state of New York. We know that for many New Yorkers, fracking sounds like a pretty good idea. We've heard the fantastic tales. Fracking will save our state from financial ruin release us from our dependence on foreign oil and revive our rural economy by bringing cash, if not fertility, to our once vibrant farmland. 
And for many farmers and landowners, the promises of cash are dizzying. To risk the fertility of the land to extract gas is just one step beyond risking the fertility of land to get one more bushel of corn or soybeans. But they might know better. Farming has not always been and need not be an extractive industry. There was a time when farmers worked with a longer view, keeping in mind their role as stewards and caretakers of the land. And that long view is the farmer's wisdom. And it is as good and wise today as it ever was. The promises of the gas industry are demonstrably false, and they miss what farmers know well. There is no independence that does not demand care and responsibility. There is no quantity of cash that can restore fertility to a poison field. And there's no adequate compensation for poison water. There is no payment, no dollar, no loan that can restore life and community to a broken world. Well, our work and the work we provide others on the farm and at the mill and at the bakery depend on fertile soil, pure water, and a viable community. And all of these are put at risk by fracking. What happens to our land in an economy bloated by gas exploitation? You know, prices rise, rents rise, and good arable land becomes scarce as acres once leased to farmers are set to quick development schemes, flimsy housing, storage barns, parking lots, man camps. What happens to our water when gas exploitation takes over? Storage pools, as safe as the Titanic was unsinkable, overflow, contaminating the soil. Inevitable leaks in well casings allow gases and frac fluids to pass into our aquifers, into our bodies, and into the bodies of our children. And what happens to communities held in thrall to gas exploitation? We've seen in other parts of the country that the boom-bust cycle of the petroleum economy breaks communities, undermining our capacity to act wisely and civilly. With every boom, a few get rich, a few do better, but all are impoverished. For every hastily built motel, there are dozens of apartments with rising rents. For every newly minted millionaire, there are many dozens who see nothing but the pain of rising costs and receding resources. And for every short-term dollar, there are hundreds of long-term losses that can never be recouped. So to go with gas is to go for broke. Well, with this bread, we're here to remind you that there is another economy, and it's one that works. This bread symbolizes a commitment to the health of New York State. It embodies the knowledge that good work not a gambler's dream is the basis of a sound and sustainable economy. The spread symbolizes the farmer's simple truth that without fertile soil, without pure water, and without strong community, we go hungry. And this spread reminds us all that the promises of gas exploitation are empty. What are we to grow in fields broken and tilled with poison? What are we to feed our children when our water and wheat are unfit? Shall we grind money to make our bread? We do have a choice. We need not poison our land to live. We need not taint our water to drink. We need not sell our future to finance our present. These are choices, not inevitabilities. So with this bread, we say, take the long view. Don't go for broke. Pay attention to the health of the soil and nourish it. Treasure pure water. Remember the value of your community and keep it whole. So if something has to be broken, Let's break bread. So I would like to get the farmers who are going to, and anybody else who is willing to carry, we're going to carry a loaf of bread, single file, up to the governor's office now. So if, if the farmers can come forward to get a loaf of bread, because we want to be led by farmers in this process. And while they're doing that, I have someone else here. I'm the Reverend Dr. Janet Adair Hansen. I am pastor at Christ Community Church in Cortland, New York, the center of the state, and I am speaking as a member of the faith community. Many years ago, the late William Sloan Coffin told Henry Kissinger that the role of the faith community is to proclaim with the prophet Isaiah, let justice roll like a river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, and your job is to fix the plumbing system. In the year 2012, the job of public officials is to protect the rivers, the streams that flow through the pipes of our plumbing system. 
In the Christian tradition, Jesus is the living water. Do you know what happens to millions of gallons of fresh water when mixed with toxic compounds to form fracking fluids? They become waters of death. Jesus also is described as the bread of life. In the Hebrew language, bread lechem is also food, the basic stuff of life. Today, we carry the basic stuff of life to the governor, to the halls of our legislators, saying we choose food over cash. We choose life over death. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start from right here. If you want to join the procession, get yourself a loaf of bread and uh, follow me and Roger. Where's Roger? Okay, I just have to make one quick stop around the corner as we're going, and then let's try to get in single file as soon as we get away from the crowd. Red coming through. Red coming through. Break bread, not shell. 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 Break bread, not chill. 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 Break bread, not chill.